pleasure to welcome Professor Andrea Peto uh, from Gender Studies Department at the Central European uh, University in Budapest. Uh, Professor Peto uh, is a gender historian, cultural historian, and uh, a researcher, yes, among, among many other, uh, include uh, gender and politics, uh, political extremism, gender history. Uh, in her research, Professor Peto uh, deals with uh, so-called sensitive issues uh, in the history, uh, and she's analyzing them from a feminist perspective. And she concentrates, uh, once again, among other things, uh, on the gendered memory of Second World War and the Holocaust, uh, and also on uh, post-war transnational justice. Uh, she focuses on women uh, as not only victims of war crimes, but also perpetrators. And uh, in such a way, uh, she undermines the dominant discourse. Um, uh, Professor Peto has edited 31 volumes in English, Hungarian, and in Russian. And her works have appeared in 17 different languages, of course, in Polish among them. And I will only mention uh, the uh, most significant works. Uh, Women in Hungarian Politics, 1945 1951, uh, edited uh, in New York in uh, 2003. And Political Justice in Budapest, after Second World War, co edited with Vicky Kovarna. Uh, and the last very significant volume, also co edited Gendered Wars, Gendered Memories. Feminist uh, Conversations on War, Genocide, and Political Violence. Uh, it was written only last year. Uh, and once again, it's a great honor and great pleasure. So it's yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for this uh, generous introduction. I have to push this now. Can you hear me now? Yeah? Now, it's on. Not necessary. Okay. So can you hear me now? Yeah? Okay. So thank you very much for the generous introduction. I'm extremely happy to be here. Congratulations to this fantastic conference. I know how much work is that, especially in our challenging times. And um, I'm happy to see old friends, colleagues, and new friends in this, in this um, audience. Uh, without further ado, I would like to st start with this um, um, uh, logo and uh, expressing uh, our grat gratitude uh, for those who actually supported us during this um, fight. The fight is not over, so please keep on watching and following what's happening with CEU. I have got some postcards there if you are interested in uh, our um, work and please uh, do not hesitate encouraging students to apply for our programs. Don't uh, let the uh, evilish plan succeed, which is actually planning to bleed out this institution. So without further ado, I would like to start the talk, uh, which is about Julia um, uh, Reich and, um, and basically a reflection of my three years of research I spent uh, doing these books, the Hungarian, the German, and the Bulgarian translation. Uh, and I also published two peer-reviewed articles in English, uh, which I was commissioned to write for special issues on history of women during communism, and uh, one on the uh, the Stalinization processes in Central Europe. So you already see that from a life history of a person, you know, what are those topics which are actually interesting for a wider audience. So in this talk, I would like to do the following things. Uh, first, unfortunately, you cannot escape a short introduction uh, of who Julia Reich was. Right? Uh, because I cannot assume that you know, like if I would talk about Virginia Woolf or uh, Gertrude Stein, everybody would know it, no matter you know, the context and the uh, is, um, is slightly different. But here, you know, I think I need to talk about uh, why she is important. 
Uh, what were my challenges in 2001? So I was doing the work between 1991 and 2001. What were the challenges I was facing when I was writing this life story? And then when I thought, you know, this is over and I'm finished with this, then uh, what were the challenges which actually showed up in the past 16 years? And then at the end, I would like to talk about those theoretical issues which are about the revisionist character of writing women's history and how the uh, memory politics of the illiberal states are actually influencing the work of uh, historians. So basically, you know, you have to survive the first surge, which is basically a kind of discussion of uh, what has happened, and then um, I'm promising a kind of um, challenging theoretical interpretation at the end. And I hope that we will have time to talk about the common challenges historians actually facing when they are working in, against, with illiberal state memory politics. Right? So that's basically the plan. So this is a very short kind of kratky course, as you would say, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Russian or in the Hungarian political history, uh, for those who are not really familiar with, uh, with this context. So the interwar period is called the Horthy regime. So there are all these important men who are labeling certain uh, period. And after 1945, this name, Laszlo Reich, he was serving as the Minister of Interior. And between 48 and 53 is the darkest period that is called the Rakoshi regime. So please try to mem I mean, memorize these names. I know it's difficult, but you know, they will come up, and I don't assume that you know them. Uh, 1949 is the first show trial in uh, Hungary. This is the Hungarian Slansky trial, for those who have got this reference. Mm -hmm. Then uh, in 1950, Kadar himself was imprisoned. 53 is the breaking point. There is this new course. 55, the political prisoners released. And the, the 6th of October, 56, is the reburial of Reich, because previously he was uh, put into an unmarked grave. Uh, the revolution, the 56 revolution, lasted for two uh, weeks. And then between 56 and 89 is the Kadar regime. And, in, uh, and then Imran Naj and the others find a refuge in the embassy of Yugoslavia, where they were deported to Romania. Then the execution of Imran Naj. And the 16th of June is the reburial of Imran Naj, which is the beginning of the new Hungary. Right? So. Uh, this photo illustrates how important the husband was. So, and especially if you have got your photo together with Stalin, you know, uh, on demonstrations, that's actually not a life insurance in the post Second World War period. So, that's of course one of the reasons why he was uh, executed. And here is a, a short excerpt from uh, the Hungarian Socialist Workers' Party Politburo meeting on the 15th of September 1981. And if you read this text, of course, Kadar Janos, the, uh, the leader, is speaking about a funeral of a woman. Because in English, you can see that he's talking about she, but not mentioning the name. Right? So we will announce that she died and we buried her. That was brief indeed. The total nonsense, that was just the same what was announced on the day when she died. In Hungarian, you cannot even recognize the gender of the person. So this discussion is referring to the death of one important person. Because, I mean, in the original text in Hungarian, the sex of the buried person is unclear. From the English translation, it is obvious that the most powerful leaders of the communist Hungary were discussing the death and the funeral of a woman. The person who was asking questions during the meeting was Janos Kadar, who determined the history of Hungary between 56 and 89, called the Kadar years. Kadar, in 1949, was the Minister of Interior, and he was responsible for murdering the husband of this woman. Her name was not mentioned during the whole meeting, but everybody knew who this person was. There was only one woman in the Hungarian history, history whose destiny was to know as personal enemies the two most influential Hungarian politicians of the post-Second World War period, Rakosi and Kadar. They together masterminded the execution of her husband after a show trial in 49. 
The husband, the legendary fighter in the Spanish Civil War, the leader of the home ground communist movement in Hungary, the Minister of Interior of Hungary after 49, who was, by the way, responsible for banning all women's organizations between 45 and 51. That was the topic of my first book, which was mentioned that I was actually looking at the documents. In Hungary, in the post-Second World War period, there were two names which were silenced. These names, after the execution of the holder of these names, were erased from documents and history, from archives. They were airbrushed from photographs, and those who knew them in person might fear of imprisonment and execution for pronouncing these names loudly, Roik and Nagy. The first name was Laszlo Roik, whose rehabilitation and reburial on the 6th of October 56 uh, provoked to be the rehearsal for the Hungarian Revolution of uh, the 23rd of October 56. The second name was Imre Nagy, the Prime Minister of the Hungarian Revolution, who was also executed by the same person, Janos Kadar, on the fifth, uh, 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 in 1958. Milan Kundera characterized the resistance against communism as a fight with power of memory, against forgetting. In the 20th century Hungarian history, we cannot name anybody else who fought with such an eloquence against the official version of forgetting as Julia Reich. She had to fight to restore her name, the name of her son, and the name of her husband against forgetting. So here is a story of her life. Uh, she was born as Földes in 1915 in a lower working class family with a strong communist tradition. In the 1930s, she lived for a while in Paris and became active in promoting red aid for Spain. She re-entered Hungary at the beginning of the Second World War. She saved lives of Jewish communists with providing false papers. She worked illegally for the Communist Party before being arrested in December 44 with her partner, uh, whom she had to take care of as a Communist Party order. And this comrade was Laszlo Reich. So basically, the Communist Party arranged her to be a kind of servant for an important male communist. So this was very normal to assign communist women in a caring role for important male comrades. Between 45 and 49, as a wife of the famous communist minister of interior, she was one of the leaders of the mass communist women's organization. Between 45 and 49, as a wife, uh, she became this leading functionary. And they were living the life of a busy professional couple. She was eager to have a child who was born in January 49. The godfather of this communist uh, uh, was the last, last uh, the godfather, sorry, of Laszlo Jr. was Janusz Kadar, who succeeded Laszlo Reich in the seat of Minister of Interior when Laszlo was appointed to this unimportant place of Minister of Foreign Affairs of the country, which at that time had no foreign policy, just friendly relationship to the Soviet Union. Laszlo Reich was not a Muscovite, he did not speak Russian, so he was totally uh, without any reference point in this job. After 49, after the execution of her husband, Yulia was sentenced to five years of imprisonment for supporting her husband's so-called subversive policy. In her trial, which took place in March 1950, nine months after her arrest, she received five years of imprisonment, having been convicted of supporting her husband. The son, Julia and La uh, the son of Julia and Laszlo, also called Laszlo, um, which was a five months old baby when his mother was arrested in June 49. The infant was taken to an orphanage and renamed as István Kovács, the most common name in Hungary. After she spent her sentence, she was released from prison as Laszlo Ne Jörg. Her name and also her son's name were changed without any consultation to doom the name of her husband into oblivion. Her appeals for official rehabilitation to the leaders of the Communist Party were signed by two names, by Reich and Jörg. After five years of imprisonment, she was freed under this different name, Jörg. Her son, who had been just five months old when she was prisoned, um, uh, uh, she was named as István Kovács. She knew that her husband needed to be rehabilitated, having been recognized as a victim of Stalinist show trials in 49. 
So she fought fiercely for his, her own name, which is Mrs. Laszlo Reich. She used her unquestionable and uncontested moral power as widow of the innocently executed hero of the communist movement to force the communist party leadership starting and completing the rehabilitation of political prisoners. And her husband was buried with all possible official honor on the 6th of October 56. The photo of the widow and her son taken at the funeral became a famous symbol through the word as a symbol of the victims of Stalinism. The language of grief is first and foremost a women's language. And this gave Reich her confidence. Standing up for her executed husband gave meaning to her own years in prison. As a wife fighting for the honorable barrier of her husband, she was also raised above the controversies and dividing lines of the Hungarian politics in general. The struggle, however, did not end with the graveside photograph of Julia accompanied by her son taken at her husband's reburial at the important cemetery in Budapest and published in the international press. The fact that the reburial was held inspired the readers of the Hungarian Revolution who saw how it was possible using a telephone, which was the Twitter at that time, to mobilize hundreds of thousands of people for a cause. Um, the resilience of Julia Roig and her insistence on the broadest publicity for her husband's reburial on the 6th of October 56 rendered the event a psychological dress rehearsal for the 56 revolution. On the 4th of November 56, when the Soviet army occupied Hungary, she asked for a political refugee right at the embassy of Yugoslavia together with Imre Nagy and of the prime minister of the Hungarian revolution. She was also kidnapped to Romania by the Soviets together with Imre Nagy and she spent there two years till she was given the permit to return to Hungary as Julia Reich. So, Mrs. Julia Reich, Laszlo Nédjörg, and now Julia Reich. She was granted permission to return to Hungary in 58 and gradually became a key figure in the opposition movement, demanding the rehabilitation of Nagy and his fellow martyrs. After 58, she became the Julia, a real institution who always protected the weak against those who are abusing their power. She was negotiating with the party leadership to protect anti-communist intellectuals. She organized the first NGO in Hungary after the ban on associations in 51, a dog shelter. She also uh, signed and supported the Charter 77, campaigned against strengthening the abortion law, she offered the compensation she received for the loss of her husband for supporting talented university students when individual charity was not accepted. She worked as an archivist in the Hungarian National Archive and she took the children of the prison freedom fighters to cake shops. So, why is she important? So, the life stories of women who joined the communist movement after the Second World War can be told in different frames. And this framing will be one of the topics I will be working on in this talk. Uh, driven by the historians and the construction of gendered political subjectivity. As there were very few women who actually hold important positions in the politics proper, they are described either as ruthless and savvy manipulators or victims who believed in the good cause, namely in communism, but allowed themselves to be misled uh, by the anti-democratic practice and they were full of good intentions uh, to promote women's rights, but somehow they did not succeed. So what were the, why, why was she so important? First, because of how she was fighting for her name and the rehabilitation. So I think I convincingly argued in the past three minutes why this is so important. The second is that she was creating a different language, an authentic language opposing the Rakoshi regime, the language of grief. And the language of communism is really this sand language of the meta language, and here we have got a different language. Also because of anti-politics, uh, she was supporting the people's colleges because of this dog shelter, and also because of the institutionalization of informality. Uh, 
so she was organized the school for the refugees, uh, for the prisoners, sorry, in, in, um, in Romania. And also she was organizing these cake shop visits. She was also ar arranging the Yulia tours when um, uh, tours to the West were prohibited. And she strongly believed in the power of conversation. She supported women's rights, uh, signing this petition in 73, supported the democratic opposition uh, as a uh, signatory of the Charter 77, and she was basically a non-compromising fighter who, against Kadar, who was this big figure during the uh, Second World War. So far, it looks like a easy story, right? So my talk is like, you know, a kind of easily flowing uh, talk, but let me tell you this was not easy. Uh, so what were the difficulties to construct this narrative which I was presenting to you in the previous um, five minutes? First of all, the family. Uh, the family, I already mentioned that the son of Julia Roig, uh, who, uh, I, whom I interviewed several times uh, during this um, project and he was very supportive, but they had the right for silence. And also that they were, uh, he was selecting what kind of documents I will have access to. And to share with me because he knew that I will be sharing it with the word in the book. The second important obstacle was that she and her husband, none of them were lovable personalities. <laughs> so in that sense, you know, there are some people who are popular and kind and everybody loves them, but they were not those ones, right? Uh, you know, no matter that Laszlo Roy clearly looked like uh, Laszlo from the Casablanca, so he was really this extremely charismatic, um, a tall, young revolutionary, uh, but I mean, he was really a ruthless communist, in a sense, you know, banning and uh, uh, organizations and using all types of methods to promote communism. Uh, and I will get back to this point. What's, what, are the, what is the price when you are working on a non-lovable person? Uh, the sources. I already mentioned the tabuization. Uh, so basically, the minutes of the trials, the surveillance records, because Julia was... Uh, uh, her phone was stabbed and you know, everybody was reports. there were lots of, actually her best friend was reporting on her. Uh, they were all, you know, gone and it was very difficult to get access to them. Uh, the other is that she was not an intellectual. So uh, she has no written sources. Uh, so there are very few documents which were actually produced by her. And we also know that these documents were not produced by her, but a group of friends who are actually helping her to produce that speech, for example. Uh, so the question is, can we consider political action as self-writing? Right? So can we look at this as a, in a in different narrative frame? And the, and the last one is the uh, oral history material. So I was basically interviewing everybody who, whom I thought would be useful. And uh, when you are doing this oral history, there is no time, of course, to get into this now. There are lots of methodological, ethical questions. But here, that because they were not lovable, the couple, uh, therefore, and they had got this very controversial life story. Therefore, the people who were talking about her, they had, um, they were mostly concerned about self-positioning and self-representation, and also about the performance, that how to represent their understanding of the Roigs in 1999, in 2000, to a feminist young female historian. I mean, all adjectives are important. Right? So this, I mean, if you have got questions, I would be happy to talk about this, but this is, yeah. And then the framework of narration. And here is this concept, the Unbildungsroman, which I think might be interesting to, uh, to use because she was a leftist woman, a communist. And during her life course from the illegal communist party, she became a wife, a widow, and a mother. Right? So this is not a Bildungsroman, right? Which is usually the other way around, but this is a different, different order. And that is actually a major challenge for feminist scholarship, and I will talk about this later. The second challenge, which is related to the framework of the narration, is that uh, 
the form of dominant feminism in Eastern Europe after 89 was a kind of liberal, neoliberal feminism. And here we have got a communist woman whose life story basically doesn't fit into these issues and in the framework, uh, which was the uh, major framework. So, you know, when I was presenting this paper at that time, always the question was, and what was her position about sexual violence and domestic abuse? And I say, okay, this is all very important, but, you know, the, yeah. And the third is, uh, and I will be talking about this in the third part of the lecture, uh, that uh, how actually the post-89 anti-communist framework actually silenced her, and how the uh, illiberal turn, which we are actually experiencing now, is actually creating now a space for her as a result of this Unbildungsroman. So now, basically, she fits into this uh, new cult of the mother, the grieving um, uh, 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 widow. Uh, so what is the role of the historian besides, you know, having this um, fabulous uh, photo coverage and posing with full makeup uh, with the cover of my um, uh, uh, book uh, and the, trans and the uh, launching the book in, in, um, in Bulgaria? So what were my hopes and what are the realities? Uh, of course, with all the hubris, right, I was hoping to contribute to rethinking of uh, women and politics and the public and private. And uh, of course, writing history of communism during, uh, uh, history of write, writing women's history in communism. However, you know, after 2001, when I closed the books, I would say, uh, there are several challenges. And here are the four, ch four challenges I will be discussing with you now. Uh, one is the dig digital access. So when I was starting to write this book, you know, emails, internet, you know, they were not there. So how did this change the framework of narration? That is the first one. The second is the personal branding, how the web pages of uh, different individuals, especially the son of uh, Julia Roig, actually changed the different sources available. The women's history turn, I will be talking about this, that uh, now not, we are not talking about gender history, but women's history most of the time. And uh, how the research on communism and women, which is this new um, field emerging in the past 10 years, actually changed the framework or hasn't changed the framework. So let's see the, these four challenges. And then after that, I would like to give some you know, theoretical discussion of this. Uh, the first challenge is about the uh, di digital access, journals, newspapers, and documents about her. We have all encountered as teachers when we are assigning tasks to the students that the first reaction is to Google, right? <laughs> Definitely in the past 16 years, more and more material is available online, so one doesn't need to travel to archives or even visit an archive in, the, in his or her own city. The material which is digitalized uh, is, uh, of course, not innocent, right? It's, uh, it's a political and it's a power process. What is being digitalized, what is forgotten, and what is not digitalized nowadays, they are actually put into oblivion. And especially in the Hungarian context, the uh, Hungarian government allegedly relocating the state archives, which are depository of the documents after 45 from the castle in the Buddha side, those have been in Budapest, the main archive is in, Buddha, in, um, in the Buddha castle and the government is moving into the castle because it's such a beautiful place. And uh, they close down the archives because they are promising to build a new building for the archives in the unknown future. So basically this kind of um, uh, research on post-45, history of Hungarian post-45 is finished, right? So what are those, um, so this is one, right? The access, the politics of the access as far as the institutions the, uh, and also the political manipulation. And the other one is about the digital activism and how the uh, certain um, uh, digital presence and the digital profile of the individuals are basically shaped by the uh, digital presence. So there are lots of um, uh, institutions, individuals who are basically there on the digital space, but when you try to find them, they are basically non-existent. 
And this, uh, next is this digital citizenship, uh, which is uh, more and more dependent on having the resources, uh, who can digitalize what and what kind of sources um, are available. So let me show you what are those, uh, what is the material what you can get. Uh, for example, international press. You cannot get the Hungarian press because there is no money for digitalization, but you can have the, uh, the, the La Repubblica and also the Spiegel online. Uh, you can also have open access archives, which is the open society archive. By now, they actually uh, digitalize all the material. And this is a major uh, source because um, this was previously uh, cataloged under a different name. So that's also the politics of archive, how you can actually hide certain documents, because this is a, a transcript of uh, the prison discussion. Uh, um, uh, so an informant in prison together with Julia Reich in 54, giving a testimony in Salzburg to intelligence officers, and it was cataloged under Kately. And now it is, um, uh, it's, um, now it's available. Uh, the Radio Free Europe discussion. I mean, then if the Radio Free Europe had the clipping up from the Hungarian press digit, uh, in their collection, now it is digitalized. But the journal itself is not digitalized because the Open Society Archive has got the resources to digitalize, but not the Hungarian press. Um, also, this book, which is a play where Julia Reich is the major protagonist, this was unavailable when I was doing my work, uh, but now you can order it on Amazon. So that's again a, a major change. Photographs, the digital photographs. And I would like to spend some minutes discussing this photo. If you Google, you know, Julia Reich in the, uh, uh, on the internet and you put the images, this is the most often seen image because this is the image from my book, the cover. And you see the unedited version of the uh, photo where, I mean, Laszlo Reich was really like Laszlo from the Casablanca. There was always a, you know, pretty handsome woman around, um, around him. But the editor in the publishing house photoshopped her out from the photo, right? So, so it means that in, in 2001, when the book was published, you know, this woman, whom, I mean, I don't know who she is, right? Was photoshopped and uh, this photo became the uh, kind of iconic photo for, for Julia Reich. And unfortunately, the original photo I was you know, trying to find out in the past weeks when I was preparing for this talk, it's lost, right? So what we have now is the originally photoshopped um, uh, photo before the period of the Photoshop, right? And that again raises the question of the responsibility of the historian besides posing for, you know, uh, press coverage that, you know, I already contributed to silencing that person who was very important. This was a harvest festival. So she was there, so it was really important, obviously, that she was standing with these important personalities. Uh, there are lots of private photographs which actually emerged from this uh, funeral on the 6th of October 56, which was the most photographed event during the 1950s. Um, uh, and that photo was the other photo, uh, which is on the cover of the other book I have. Um, so personal web page. And um, uh, last, uh, last Lorraine, uh who is um, a well-known stage designer, he was the stage designer of the Son of Soul, uh, the Academy Award winning uh, Hungarian movie. He's a, a teacher, he's um, one of the, uh, he was an MP for a while, so he's a, he has a career on, on his own and he started his own web page. And when I was browsing on his web page, I surprisingly found several photos and documents. He did not give it to me, made it available to me when I was writing the book. So what are those photos he left hidden from me but put up to the internet? Uh, first of all, the uh, family photo of uh, his mother. So these are the Ferdi sisters sometime in the 1930s. Uh, this uh, is a Here's Janos Kadar, who is from the Kadar regime. Here is Laszlo Reich, and the woman who is smoking cigarette because she was a chain smoker is Julia Reich. So, for example, this photo was not given to me, although here you really see the dramatic, 
I mean, by now, if you are looking at this photo, you see the drama, right? Because you know that this man is actually giving the order to uh, execute the other one. Um, but there were some intimate photos. And the question of kind of digital intimacy <laughs> needs to be raised here, because here the couple is in the Crimea, where they went for a, a holiday. And the other one is the only photograph where three of them are together. And actually, this is uploaded with the subtitle that this is the only photo where the family is together. So basically, this digital space is reconstructing this uh, kind of extremely traditional domesticity. And if you look at her with this arm, hair band on her, um, I mean, this is really this very traditionalized picture. But I mean, this couple was the ideal couple of the communist movement, right? So, and this is now um, uh, available. And this photo is also available, which is the site. I mean, it's very gloomy now, but it's originally gloomy. Uh, it's a bad, very bad photo. What you see is a part of a forest. This is where originally last Leroy was buried, right? And um, this is the photo. OK. Um, and you can also ask the question why, um, you know, he, wait, um, uh, he did, um, I did this book during three years, and I was really rushing to write the book because I felt this story is horrible and it's killing me, and I, fi I felt totally depressed. And sometimes, you know, I just wanted to, you know, finish this. And when I made the last interview with um, the, uh, the, uh, the son last week, I told him that, you know, I, I'm really close to finishing because I want to finish this because I want to get out from your life. And then, you know, he's, he was smiling and said, can you imagine how do I feel? So in this, I think, you know, there are lots of questions we need to ask here. You know, what are the limits of uh, uh, being a part of somebody's life? And, you know, can you really move out from this? And uh, since I wrote this life story, I became a part of the Roik story because everybody, if somebody's writing about Roik, you know, my story was, uh, my book is um, uh, quoted. Okay, the next one is the women's history term. I received an email from a dear friend, Padre Akini, who suggested that I should help his PhD student who is planning her first book project on women in prison. Anna Müller first appeared in my mailbox asking for documents. I told her that I think all the documents have been published, but I can ask. I turned out how wrong I was as those documents have materialized from the private archive of Laszlo Reich which I have never seen and I have never dreamed about. So what are those documents which actually appeared as a request to be published in a book in Poland by EPN about women in prison, which, is, which are not on the website and which were not given to me? And um, uh, there, were, there were three letters which were sent from Romania by um, uh, Julia Roig to her family, and, um, but this is not, I mean, these are normal letters written with her very kind of heavy handwriting. Uh, I don't, I mean, that's, uh, but there is something which actually breaks your heart, I think. And this is um, a, a photo of uh, Laszlo Roig, 11 months old, and this photo was given to her after the execution of Laszlo Reich, and she kept it during her imprisonment. And um, the, the handwriting is her handwriting on the, on the back of the photo. So it's really a question, what happened that you know, this kind of photo was not given to me in 2001, it's not on the web page, but it was given to be published to a book in Poland by EPN, which is at the moment uncertain, as I see, and I hope that this will actually be uh, so. Um, so what has changed, right? And now I'm getting to the theoretical part of the, of the talk. Um, if I can, uh, I mean, this picture kills me. So research on women during communism. And there is a PhD, for example, 
uh, which is discussing the Hungarian Women's Democratic Association, which is this association Julia Reich was heading between 45 and 49. But the story is basically a Bildungsroman, right? That how this mass women's association of the communists contributed to the women's emancipation project. And Julia Reich's story is an unbildungsroman, right? So she was basically not loved by her uh, associates. She was not really um, uh, effective. And later on, she was basically becoming a person known by um, um, uh, who is a mother and a wife. Uh, on the other hand, she was, as I pointed out, she was active to promote the democratic opposition and whatever. But basically, her standing was as a mother and a wife. So, what to do with this? How to make sense of this? And I would like to bring in this uh, new frame, which is uh, actually probably explaining you know, all these changes and resurfacing of different uh, personal documents. And that is related to historical revisionism. And of course, revisionism is this very bad you know, story and very bad connotation, but I'm using this uh, uh, typology by Tucker, uh, who is actually uh, uh, using, um, defining the three types of revisionisms. The significance-based, the evidence-based, and the value-driven. And uh, uh, this kind of, um, uh, so what has happened 16 years after my book was published in 2001, and how this book has succeeded or hasn't succeeded in building out the canon of its own while questioning the concept of a canon itself. The, did the result of my biography become an integral part and indispensable part of history writing, which is confined to the national frame? Uh, has the gender as a category of analysis produced the expected epistemological change? What kind of changes were initiated by the reappearance of anti-modernist frame in history writing? And to understand this kind of, I mean, I, I think this typology is pretty you know, uh, self-explanatory, but uh, my argument is that exactly the fact that women's history is slowly becoming a counter canon in the newly pro polarized historical narrative will offer new opportunities. The fact that gender as a category of analysis led to genderism should be considered as a possibility for change. In my 2001 book, I considered the aim uh, to go all the way from a non-existing intellectual position to integration and institutionalization. I thought it is possible, among others, because women's history belongs to the genre of revisionist history which transforms methods of history writing leading to an epistemologic, epistemological change and includes new previously forgotten sources in the analysis. So I'm basically arguing that women's history is significance or value-driven revisionist history writing, right? And this kind of revisionism is on the one hand an opportunity, on the other hand it's a doom. So that's what I will be actually talking about. I'm not doing this, but. Uh, and here I would like to bring in this concept of the polypore state. And, uh, uh, and also the inability of the progressive political forces to come up with emotionally engaging alternatives to the vision of the future. And you know, this uh, concept of the polypore state we coined together with my PhD student, Veronika Grzabalska, who some of you might know, and uh, this was published in the Huffington Post for all other places, and there will be a peer-reviewed long article which is coming out uh, discussing the concept of polypore state. And I in brackets, I just would like to highlight this, the importance of this kind of publication strategy in a sense that we started to put out our ideas in the Huffington Post and read by 60,000 people and read and translated to French and Spanish and Estonian. And there will be a peer-reviewed article which will be read by 23 people, right? So in a sense, I just would like to you know, encourage you to think about different spaces when you are talking about the uh, your work, because the polypore state, and I would like to bring in these three, I mean, if you, before you start Googling what polypore is, this is the, this uh, mushroom which lives on the trunk of the tree, 
right? And uses the energy and sources from the trunk of the tree, and, but it's a kind of mushroom. And of course, it's an extremely biologizing metaphor, but I think that it might help us to understand the challenges and also uh, the possibilities of what this polypore state means for writing women's history, right? So the polypore state basically creates a parallel civil society. It means that there is this mirroring of the agenda and the institutions of the, um, uh, of the already existing uh, civil society. They are the gongos, the government-sponsored uh, NGOs, which are actually serving the state, getting the support from the state, and they are basically appropriating, instrumentalizing the language and the issues of the, uh, of the previously existing secular human rights-based NGOs. It is using a security narrative. So there are always enemies, there are always foreign agents, there are always uh, somebody whom you have to fight against. And no matter these are the refugees or George Soros or whoever. And this is basically, and here we arrive to the point, privileging familialism over women's rights. So it talks about families and doesn't talk about women. Right? So this kind of um, parallel, kind of major paradigm change uh, can be also traced in the history writing. And um, this is a, a screenshot from the Hungarian Committee for National Remembrance. And there, her husband is there as a major communist, right? And she's, of course, not there. So let me summarize the three reasons why there is a paradigm change here why there is not a, it's not a backlash. I think you know, historians should the, uh, recognize the earlier uh, they can uh, come up with strategies the, uh, the, uh, the earlier. And then I would like to go for the conclusion. So that's basically the plan. So what are the three challenges of this, um, of this polypore state? Uh, and how it is connected to writing gender history, right, and, and uh, women's stories. I already br brought in the concept of revisionism and the value and the significance driven uh, uh, re uh, revisionism. And that is the point uh, when you have the uh, populist reconceptualization of what history is, what historians are expected to do if they are paid by state money. And what happens when you have got more and more individuals coming up with their own stories and they are saying that's the real history. So this populist turn, which is actually supported by the increasing participation of the individuals in producing this kind of laic history, but it's not laic history, right? Because women's history basically started as a revisionist history, saying that we are encouraging women to come up with their stories and that their voices, because that's the way to somehow reconstruct and retransform um, women's uh, history, the canon, the counter canon. Right. So three challenges. The first, uh, People's Europe it has resurfaced the idea of reconceptualizing the community of values defining Europe, the importance of nation. The nation states has increased by cultural differences are also increasing, which contributes to the strengthening of history writing in the national frame. So you have got on the one hand methodological nationalism. On the other hand, you have got the reality of nation, nation states, institutions of uh, uh, producing knowledge in the national framework. Uh, paradoxically, that doesn't necessarily mean that the popularity and the impact of women's history is in decreasing. Just the opposite. It is actually a political meeting point for various actors of the historiographical, artistic, and political scenes. The history of women slowly became a legitimate topic in different national history writing. I should only mention how the topic of female political prisoners has become an important research topic in institutions specialized on constructing national remembrance. They are making the women visible. Life story of Julia Roig actually framed in this framework. The way women saw and experienced the nationalization of agriculture, 
or the persecution of churches during communism also became important topics. Increasing women's visibility being the aim of feminist history writing, there was a clear confluence. But the nation-centered narrative maintains its self-standing community paradigm, and women are considered as one group, among others, as an appendix, as Virginia Woolf said. Virginia Woolf, everybody knows that. The popularity of the thematization remained, notwithstanding feminist endeavor. The second feature, in, induced by the definition of women's history, writing as a part of modernity, that historians working outside Central Europe are defining themselves as representative of modernity, as opposed to most of those who are working in the various national contexts. Uh, this is the, uh, there are now trenched into the position of propagandist or foreign agents, right? So those who are actually working on women's history based on a secular human rights based context, they are labeled as the provincial avant-garde on the one hand, on the other hand as security threat because of this uh, kind of secular security narrative of the, of the polypore state. So what are the consequences? First of all, it strengthened the definition of Central Europe as a specific region. This is contributing to the surge of the V4, the Visegrad 4. And, um, uh, and the historians committed to self-standing women's history miss the national professional background, usually providing professional legitimacy. And this position is further weakened because since 1989, the human rights discourse, which could have given political legitimacy to women's history writing, pushed back to the defensive position. So a revisionist discourse was actually attacked by a revisionist discourse. So by this populist challenge, a revisionist genre of writing history was actually challenged, I would say, fundamentally threatened by another discourse, which is also a revisionist discourse. And the third challenge is that there is a new discussion, which is about communist feminism, if that existed at all. And there is this summarizing dossier by Aspasia, the International Yearbook of Center Eastern and Southern uh, European Women and Gender History, uh, which is focusing on how history of women and gender history in Central and Eastern Europe, and they are listing taxative achievements. It is very understandable, due to the disillusionment with the neoliberal policies, that critical intellectuals will revisit, revise, and turn to the re-evaluation uh, of statist feminism, as it existed under communism. This scholarship is mostly focusing on different women's organizations on national and international uh, level. And the debate about this discussion between Nanette Fung and D Draculic illustrates that this is a very uh, interesting discussion. The story of Julia Reich doesn't fit into this research agenda because of this Anbildungsroman, right? So because if it is not supporting this kind of feminist communism existing. And no matter that she has been always a self-confessed communist. So these are the three challenges which are there. So what are the future tendencies? What are the, let me show this. What are the consequences of the present trends as far as future of uh, writing of women's history? The ever-growing revisionist history writing is impacting in an exemplary way uh, the abundance of sources available on the internet and also history politics, the local keyword for using history in order to legitimize political claims. Revisionist history writing is applying with success methods, the theories, which are also used by women's history writing, and doing so, they are successfully creating a counter canon. This one, however, doesn't leave space to any other ways of thinking, and what is more important, there is no dialogue between the various would-be canons. The best example for this is the quotation policy of the work in women's history, where either the works are ignored or crammed together in one footnote referring to the so-called gender perspective. Hemings pointed out that this is a very ineffective way of, oh, sorry, a, Sigmund Freud, a very effective way of silencing and building up narratives and canon. 
This means that there is a challenge, which is by now also a political challenge. And it is not an internal affair restricted to a professional club, club of women's history writers. Julia Reich's life, Julia Reich life story should be presented differently. It is not a Bildungsroman, a story that developed out of her childhood experiences, her socialization in a leftist working class family, as her father was a soldier during the short-lived communist revolution of 1919 and being watched by the police after that. She was, a, she was a committed social democrat and a member of the underground communist party and she remained so until her death in 1981. She always used her power, the power of a widow, a power which is this institutionalized informal power as a victim of the show trials to achieve what she has wanted, the rehabilitation of her husband as a wife and as a mother. But this unbildungsroman process of learning, adoption to the changing political circumstances, and not giving up the values, is basically can be considered as what Nila Yuval Davis is going, the rooting and the shifting. So she was constantly doing this kind of renegotiations. Re and this was an agonistic fight, and also an antagonistic fight, using Chantal Mouffe's term, uh, for open spaces for intellectual forms of resistance. But her life story illustrates complexities of gender and communism as far as the construction of female subjectivity is concerned. She was masterfully using the vulnerability of women's stories and of course that was used now by the populist challenge to construct women as mothers and uh, supporters of the family in, the, in this discourse. Paul Frost pointed out, and I'm quoting him, the significance of witnessing for contemporary conjunction between personal experience, shareable knowledge, and public representation. So this uh, personal experience, shareable knowledge, and public uh, representation. Life story of Julia Reich was a shareable knowledge in 2001. By 2017, it is a part of the women's her story turn together with this anti-communist term validating her story, which is actually questioning the feminist grounding of my project. The public representation um, independently from the high number of sources available online is constructing her digital citizenship, the web page of her son and in my bi uh, biography as a mother and as a widow. Uh, so finishing with this, uh, uh, with, a, with a story, when I was recently invited to the Reich College, uh, this is a kind of elite fraternity of the University of Economics, uh, to talk about her life, there was a discussion about the importance of Julia Reich. Because this happened in 2011, when the new government started to redefine to rename the different street names and to purge the latest, uh, the communist names of the different communist um, uh, uh, and leftist and progressive personalities from the street names. And there was a discussion what to do with the Reich College. And um, uh, during the meeting with the representatives of the college, uh, they were suggesting that they should keep the name, the Reich, just name Julia Roy, and that would be very economic because they don't need to re-change the, uh, the stamps and the whatever. But then somebody s stood up and said they, that this is a joke. They dismissed this idea that this is a joke. Uh, and I think we should stop here because um, the second saw that this was a joke to rename a fraternity of the University of Economics after this woman whose life story you have heard in the first part of the talk. And then uh, basically saying that she did not have the merit uh, to be, you know, the name, to give her name to this uh, institution. I think it basically demonstrates my failure and also the failure of the past um, uh, 20 years to try to change the framework of narration.
So I'm basically finishing with a very bad tone. And thank you very much for the attention. Thank you. Um, what I was suggesting is that definitely there is a normativity in this research. This is a revisionist history. I mean, every history writing is a certain revisionist history. So, and especially women's history, which is together with labor history and uh, 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 this uh, post-colonial history. I mean, this is revising the canon. So it actually is in this particular framework where it's a normative framework. And uh, what I was saying is that um, uh, that was a reference to, you, to Julia Reich and her life story that uh, basically doesn't really fit into this particular framework because I believe that um, uh, at the end Julia Reich is, uh, her story is the, uh, the result of several layers of forgetting. Uh, first, because she was uh, uh, not communist enough and then she was too communist. And then in this, um, uh, what I call new women's history turn, she's not communist enough again. But there are several other layers in her life story, which uh, because of this revisionism, they are not visible. So between 58 and 1989, uh, she was really, uh, uh, sorry, 81 when she died. Uh, this was a story of uh, supporting the democratic opposition. And that was uh, uh, the different um, uh, representatives of the democratic opposition. And this story and this kind of discussion now in this illiberal context is basically a story which is not told, uh, not discussed, and hasn't been critically evaluated. And also being in a position of um, uh, uh, writing about women, uh, I was receiving basically two important critical comments when I submitted this uh, book to the, uh, this was my habilitation uh, uh, dissertation. One was that she is a bad example for women and politics because she was not doing politics. 
this was one. And the other one was that I was using oral history testimonies, and they are not serious because you know oral history testimonies are always constructed, you know, depending on the moment of time. So here you see we have got on very shaky ground, and that's why I would suggest to think, at, you know in a different framework, which is about the framework of institutionalization of gender studies and women's studies, and also how the, uh, in the past 25 years or 27 years, basically gender history was not really integrated into neither the national canon nor the institutional framework. And this is not, you know, the Hungarian or the Polish kind of Armageddon or plea or whatever, but that's a kind of Eastern European phenomenon, but at the same time it's happening uh, at that time when uh, there is this illiberal attack and the illiberal uh, transformation. So that's why it's a very complex phenomenon and, the, and you have got the proliferation of different um, works and different ideas and different institutions. But what is the bottom line is those who are supporting the secular human rights based progressive ideas, they are kind of shrinking into a position of a subculture and also getting less and less support in institutions. So while on the one hand there is a political need to reconsider, to reevaluate, to revise to uh, the history of the communism from a gender perspective, and that's why it's excellent that you know, there are more and more women are actually, and men are doing this. On the other hand, this is happening while there are so many different other things happening and different institutional ideological issues are happening. And uh, the result of this revision is basically the construction of a separate sphere and the kind of ghettoization of certain uh, uh, intellectual uh, position. So I would say that um, uh, it's important this is happening, but for example, her story, which is such a complex story, can be only, you know, one slice can be understood. And I would, uh, and, and that doesn't make this kind of research easily communicatable, especially when there is this dominant anti-communist, anti-progressive framework. So you cannot really counteract this strong anti-communism, which is, you know, by the different institutes of national remembrance, which is now institutionalized on the European level as well, with the assistance of the leftist and, uh, and, uh, and, and liberal forces, with celebrating a normative revisionism. Because you know, that's what Eric Hobsbawm said, my truth is as valid as your truth, right? So in this context, there will be this fight of different values and different uh, uh, understandings. And uh, I'm not sure that um, uh, uh, this is a good strategy. And I, I don't have an answer. So basically, I don't have an answer what uh, sh uh, sh uh, should be done. But there is definitely a populist challenge. There is a need for communicating uh, ideas, and there is really no space to do that, in a sense that there is this dominant anti-communist framework, uh, and then the response to this anti-communist framework is a separate ghettoized, uh, you know, extremely underfunded research on uh, communism and gender. I mean, you can of course always hope that subcultures are emerging and they are becoming dominant cultures, but at the moment it doesn't look good. So that's my that's my position. If I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, the ghettoization of, of, of knowledge, essentially, of, of these separate spaces. There's no more common space or common ground anymore right. uh, to which to, to talk 
Uh, yeah. We're even speaking different languages, different right. worldviews. So um, I guess, I mean, I, well, my question was going to be, what's your vision? But you just said you don't have a vision uh, for like progressive. You yeah. know, what what are these alternative narratives that we can that we can provide um, uh -huh. to find this common space? But also, what is I guess what is the um, nature and place of the state in all of this? I mean, it seems like you're describing like, uh, we're living through kind of like a revisionist state itself. And so I guess should we even, I know he's thinking about this conference and how it fit, you know, this palace run by, uh, <laughs> you know, this is partially run by the state of Poland. I wonder how long this is gonna last. Um, but yeah, that's my question. Should we seek, I guess should we keep trying to put these, should we try to put these women narratives into a national narrative or should we keep them as separate micro histories? Like what should be our kind of political strategy in this framework? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I struggle with this. Should, should we try to in, insert it into a, a mainstream or, or should we be happy with, 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 um, with being out, because the mainstream is so corrupt or, you know, um, uh, delegitimize that, that we should just be happy with our like, yeah. kind of separate spheres. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, thank you. Thank you. This is, this is actually an important question. And um, what I would say is that the first step is acknowledging the responsibility uh, and also recognizing that we are living in a, a time when it's a Gramscian socializational fight. Yeah. And it's a socializational fight for values. And you cannot, I mean, if you have got one value, you cannot have the other one. So in a sense, um, my suggestion, because I'm doing lots of political work, if you look at my CV, I also consider, you know, doing this um, kind of ivory tower work and producing the peer-reviewed articles and books and blah, blah, blah. On the other hand, going out and trying to make the change and communicate it to different actors who are not necessarily ready to listen. Because um, uh, uh, it's easy to, you know, stuck to the point that we are a tag that's a backlash and we are just, uh, you know, they are the bad ones and we are the good ones. And we are the good ones. I mean, this is, you know, please don't misunderstand me. But on the other hand, if we are the only ones who know that, right, that, then we did something wrong, yeah. fundamentally wrong. Yeah. And that's why I spent some time explaining my publication strategy and also you know, doing lots of um, public outreach talks, which of course I cannot enter on my CV when I'm you know, submitting my uh, evaluation in this neoliberal academia. But I find this important to make the change. But fake science, fake history, fake news came some, from somewhere. And uh, so this is not something which basically, you know, popped up, right? And uh, like, you know, uh, but we also have a responsibility in there. So what I would suggest, and in that sense, the, the research on communism and gender, right? It actually tries to define certain values. So I truly give credit for that kind of research. But I think that we have to reconsider our work, our strategy, our language, our publication strategy as a result of this populist threat, which is not necessarily a threat because people are interested in history. And history became kind of the, a part of this mnemonic security discussion. I don't, I'm sure you are familiar with this concept that gender became a symbolic glue, if you look at this article we have wrote, you know, gender and history of family, they are the sites where all this discussion is happening. And the other one is about memory politics and memory and, and, gen and, this, and the intersection is gender history. So never in the history of uh, history writing, in the historiography, gender history was so important than now. And I mean, I consider it as a great opportunity and I started my talk with this attack against CEU, which, you know, from when the attack started from this point onwards, I'm receiving press requests two, three times a week 
interviews, uh, whatever. So this is an opportunity. People are interested what I have to say. So this is the hic rodus hic salta. So this is the moment to show your colors, if you have colors. <laughs> and that's the question. Do we have colors? Do we have you know, anything meaningful to say besides, you know, we are attacked, we are the poor one, help us. And uh, that also connected to the concept of the state. And that's why I think that the concept of the polypore state, no matter, it's extremely biologizing. It actually helps us to think about this. Because everybody is depressed, sad, exhausted, you know. <laughs> but this is the strategy of the polypore state. Because it's using the energies and the resources and whatever in order to somehow weaken the tree. And of course, I understand that the tree has got this teleological, you know, united. That the tree, but maybe, you know, look at the branches of the tree, that there are different branches of the tree. So, but uh, the, the polypore state is basically working on your energy. So therefore, you have to be extremely strategic against what you are fighting, pick your fight, and intervene when it's really important and necessary. So this is basically doing politics every second of your moment. And this is the repoliticization of academia, everyday life, and whatever. And you can say it's bad, because just, you just want to be a kind of normal bourgeois, right? Who is just, you know. But unfortunately, this has never existed, this idea. Because just think about the history of the women's movement. I mean. The, the reason why we can sit in this palace and so many women, you know, acknowledged women are sitting here is because we are standing on the shoulders of women who actually fought for this. I mean, this is a kind of common sense on the level of the coelho, but still, you know, this, it, you, it needs to be acknowledged that, and if you want to have the future generation also sitting here, this is the moment to fight for it. Here, here. Yeah. 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 And, uh, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, you know, the, there are lots of conflicts inside the feminist movement, like generations. So I'm a tenured professor. I mean, the young generation, you will be never tenured. I have a bad news. So in a sense, you know, there is this precariousness in the academic life as well. And also this is happening at the same time when uh, uh, the securitization is changing the whole, whole framework and the the work of uh, Veronika Grzebelska on the paramilitarization of Central Europe is actually very important because, of course, we are talking about domestic violence and whatever, but the roots are there in the militarized culture. So uh, what I can say is that uh, we have to have a new strategy, new discussion, but we, the good news is, is that we have actually some resources and inspirations to go back. So I found myself reading a lot of 19th century things, and uh, I mean, because the problems and the you know, discussion is, is, this is one of my inspirations, and I just suggest you to do that. And the other inspiration I have is actually coming from Julia Reich, and that's the reason why actually when I was asked to do the keynote, I, I, um, I thought about this, because uh, the way how she was fighting against the communist state, I think it's really, really inspiring. So uh, my personal intellectual development is the, was really inspired by the flying universities, these kind of underground universities which were there in the 1980s. And this tradition of the flying universities, which was run by these liberal intellectuals, male intellectuals, I have to say, uh, actually ended up with the institutionalization of the Central European University. Uh, which is now, of course, struggling with its legacy. So how to be a free space at the same time, it's a neoliberal institution, which is mostly interested in you know, measuring the impact factors and whatever. But originally, it came from a very different tradition, which is against the state, because the state was not providing what the citizens were hoping for. And this is a real challenge here, because the illiberal, the, the polypore state, is providing social security and also support for mothers, and, and it actually implements a leftist program. It's a leftist program, what the neoliberal left failed to do in the past 25 years. So on the one hand, you have got a state which is servicing, providing uh, the citizens and women, right? On the other hand, the price for this is uh, the curtaining and the taking away of certain freedoms. 
So basically what we see is that after four, there was a consensus after 1945 that the uh, human rights and capitalism, they are basically you know, working together and every will be, everybody will be you know, flourishing and that will be the happiness. But this consensus is over. And this consensus is over because on the one hand you cannot provide for everybody, so you have to define who are, because there is this uh, provincialization of Europe and you know, Europe is getting poorer and poorer, so they have to define you know, who are those who are getting into this privileged caste. Uh, on the other hand, the price for this is the selection process. Who will be those who will be provided for and provided with uh, resources? And you know, during communism, that was also the, the, uh, the, um, um, the situation. And you know, when my students are asking, what is the source of your energy? I was saying that I was brought up during communism when you, know, you had to make the choice. You will stay poor and, uh, uh, and somehow independent, or you collaborate. And here again, you have got this choice. And uh, you know, I'm a person for compromise and also thinking about discussion and, and dialogue. But on the other hand, you have to think very carefully about your personal integrity and the discussion what is possible for you f to keep your uh, autonomy and to keep your personal space. And uh, here, you know, the strategies which are used during communism, the flying universities, tea clubs of the 19th century, middle class women, for example, they worked very well, uh, starting reading clubs, I mean, you know, local, organizing on the local level. And I think that this um, association of gender studies in Poland, what you have and we don't have in Hungary, for example, that's a very good hub for different activities. And uh, you don't need to think about a clean slate. So it's not you know, something new, but you know, trying to take one step back and reevaluate what you have, what you don't have, who are your enemies, who are your friends. And this is a political moment, a fundamentally political moment. And you should not be scared that you are actually doing mm. politics when you are going to see your dean or your head of department. That's a political moment. It means somebody will lose, somebody will gain. And you know, there is, you do not need to be shy about this. This is a moment when you have to do this um, fight because, uh, you know, I don't want to be more dramatic than I'm already, but uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is the question of the, of the future. And, and because it's a great moment, because of this intersection of gender and history. And that's, why, that's where you can get the liberal state, because that's the heart of the liberal state. So gender historians can really make the change. Thank you. Thank you so much for this, uh, I think, very optimistic conclusion, because it's optimistic to have a challenge. Uh, so once again, thank you. Uh, it was really great to see you. Thank you.